it catches everyone off guard when I say I never went to university. A lot of the things I learned, I taught myself. You can start making a game now with no coding experience. There are a lot more engines which have a free version, so it's definitely more accessible. Define what sector you want to go into first. Pick the thing you enjoy. Decide what your end goal is. If it is AAA, you are going to have to go to university. Finding what area you want to go into as early as you can. Hello and welcome to the Expert Lounge. I'm delighted to welcome to the sofa today, TJ Williams, who is the director and co-founder of Impact Gamers. Hi, TJ. Hi, thanks for having me. No problem. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. Um, so you'll, you'll know a little bit about the podcast. Um, yeah. We're going to talk about your career, um, about your company, about the industry that you work in, and try and get some insights into your journey, um, the highs, the lows, um, and those little nuggets of advice that you might be able to give to any of our listeners um, with an interest in in gaming and in the games industry. Sounds good. There's a, a lot <laughs> to unravel. Um, but yeah, no, there's always plenty of things to share from the games industry. It sounds like a dream job. So tell me a little bit about your background and how a career in the games industry started. So for me personally, my my routine was a bit of a not 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 very um, vanilla or normal way of going into the industry um i i started off i studied games development mm -hmm. everything going completely like as planned smoothly and then i decided to just railroad and go into more of a military path so i did there was a, a NACRO program mm -hmm. which was a pre-military program you kind of decide what route you want to go in and they train you to a point where you could then go in and start doing like your, your training um so you, you get them put on base and train with the military it gives you all the experience but um i passed all that and i thought oh, i think i want to do this and then i had an injury which meant i just could not proceed so um after that i decided to put all my energy into something positive whilst i was recovering and I ended up bumping into Adam, who I work with mm -hmm. now, and we'd met years before at a youth centre we used to do some work with. And that was it. Um, I, after getting some experience working with young people and getting a lot, putting a lot of energy into it, Adam just said, do you, do you want to start teaching young people how to make games? Um, and, and that's it. It just started from there. So we just put, um, made his own time and just made this after school group where we'd teach people how to make games. We were both passionate about making games, but both had experience um, and a passion for working with young people. So it just snowballed from there. We um, became a, a registered company then, and we started doing more and more workshops. We started getting more notice from um, the local museum. So the um, Science and Media Museum in town, they started hiring us in to do workshops. Um, it just snowballed. We ended up getting invited in to do events and stuff. So um, a lot of the stuff we did, we um, taught ourselves this program, which not many people knew how to use. There weren't even many manuals for it. Um, so we became quite caught up on this particular program, which was really good for teaching young people how to make games. So it just kind of escalated from there. Then we ended up winning an award, and then that's that's it. It just got more and more attention okay well i'll ask you a little bit more yeah, about yeah. the uh, uh, award um in a moment so you, you talked about doing a games design course yeah. was that a degree did you have a did you have an interesting game in growing up yeah I, and, and and was that what led you into that yeah sort of field i've always been really passionate about playing games like i'd played games from as long as i can remember um so t what sort of thing are we talking you know nintendo yeah we had a, a the, the family console we had like, always had a nintendo family console okay. and then when we got older um i got a nintendo 64 for like for myself and uh, but I, I grew up with playing like mario and um like sonic the hedgehog and stuff so like yeah. 1991 you know like 
um, Sonic and, and Mario games. And from then it just grew. Like Pokemon became quite a big thing growing up. Um, and eventually I went on and I thought, I actually want to make films. And when I applied for the course, it was um, it was a college course and it was in media, but it said in brackets, games development. And I thought, actually, I really like playing games. I play them all the time. Um, I'm really passionate about games. I'll, why don't I just do this? It's still media. There's some overlap. Um, but the way it's, it's like eight core subjects, which are uh, foundations in like games development. So I did the course and I just loved it. And I thought, do you know what? After doing this, it kind of cemented it for me, but I didn't want to make films anymore. I, I wanted to make games. Um, and then a lot of stuff I, I taught myself how to make some stuff with different programs and like 3D modeling, but the the course was really good. So you, so that was a, a college course. Yes. And then from there you went and uh, went to university and did a no, degree. No, I it catches everyone off guard when I say I never went to university. Um, a lot of the things I learned I taught myself, and I just kind of didn't want that delay. I thought this program, no one. Um, can really learn it properly there wasn't many manuals so we just taught ourselves it so me and adam just sat and for years just learned this this particular program i want to know what the program is so click team fusion 2.5 oh. um okay. we're now partnered with click team um, we actually make a lot of their learning resources for them um which has been a great partnership but for years we just learned more and more about development um i did some extra qualifications outside when when i took jobs in like um Prus and um, like i was a media tutor for a while they so they offered to let us do some more qualifications whilst we were there um but i i, I never actually went to university just self-taught a lot of things and then um just gained a lot of experience i think that's that's really interesting because a lot of people that will be listening to this yeah. um you know it's great to hear that there's different routes in yep. to, to job roles. and you One know, of the, the most common questions we get is, did you go to uni for a role? And if you go to a AAA studio, nine times out of ten, they will ask for someone who's been to uni and got degrees because that's just how they... It, it's, it's a better way for them to search through hundreds of people applying. Mm -hmm. um, but there's many people who are studio leads that made a studio himself who are self-taught. Um, I've met a few and they've not gone to unit have taught himself a lot of stuff and then just made a studio so i'm going to tell you a little bit about my um my own experience of gaming and it's quite historic and it's quite limited mm. so i um i started out on a zx spectrum 48k um we're talking 1983 yeah. um the graphics were really poor um and i was really bad at most of the games that i played so i'm i remember playing horace goes skiing are you familiar with this? I'm trying to think of the, there's there's one I'm thinking of and it's not that one. Yeah, um, Daley Thompson's Decathlon, quite a big game at the time back in '83, um, and I actually revisited it on a, a, one of these sort of um, emulators on yes. a, on a PC, yep. and I didn't realise how horrific the graphics were. Yep. Um, they were so basic. So what what was it about? playing games that inspired you to want to make games it was for me i think part of it was um i i quite liked my own company growing up so i really liked if i could do something by myself and be entertained i really appreciate that time but also i just i weren't the most social character so once i got home that's where i wanted to stay i didn't want to go out and like play with my friends um and if i ever felt kind of a bit secluded i think just games give me that escape that was all it was for me i was in a different world and i was happy there and and that was it so playing like pokemon stuff like that um i don't know the, the world even for the graphics being back when there were it was still an immersive experience mm -hmm. so for me a lot of it was just um the joy of out of it but also the the escapism for me and i guess games have become so so much more sophisticated and yeah. you know when i think about a game now it will it will have a narrative it will it it will have you know really developed characters um and and you think about the environments that are created yeah. it really is that sort of bringing together of film 
um, storytelling, but also the the technical aspects behind that, the coding, um, uh, uh, and all of the work that goes into sort of yeah. um, generating that that end product. Um, so I'm kind of interested. Were you mathematical? Um, it, were you particularly interested in in IT and 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 that when you were at school? For me, I mean, I I, I did I did enjoy my maths and science um, when I was at school, but I actually learned most of my stuff outside of school to do with IT. So I I, I did take up there was a course called DIDA when I was at school, and it was diploma in digital applications, and it's the only thing offered at school at the time, which was in the realm of what I wanted to do, but it still didn't really touch the surface of what I wanted to do. Um, so my parents got me a laptop and that was it. I just sat at home learning how computers worked and just installing loads of new stuff, which my parents didn't have a clue about. And I just learned that way. I just trial and error. Um, so then when I was at school, um, after completing the course and stuff, I just, I didn't really feel fulfilled in learning what I'd wanted. So I. Uh, college was a much better experience. It was a lot more in the field I went to learning. But um, when me and Adam first met, it was at, at this youth centre and it was the first time um, Adam had introduced this kind of game making course, similar kind of like, I guess, the alpha stage of what we do now. Um, and I, I tried it then and I, I made my first game when I was about 13. And after that, I was like, this is it. This is I, I actually made it as a birthday present to my mum. I just remade Space Invaders, and that was that was it. I literally just did that for a birthday, and after that, was um, she pleased with that as a present? She loved it. Yeah, <laughs> um, I made it a bit too difficult. It was um, non intentionally. It was a glitch in the game, which made it a bit too difficult. So um, is she a gamer. <sighs> My mum was the first person in our family to complete Halo. So mm. for Christmas, she got my dad it for Christmas. She just sat and completed it herself. But she's not she's not what your class is a gamer. She's just uh, had moments where like going through Tomb Raider, Halo, there's some stuff she's enjoyed, but um nah, she's not as much now. I think the um you know, I'm talking about the 80s when actually to to buy a computer was really expensive or yeah. to buy a, a, a gaming console yeah. um, and I guess over time you know that whole market has opened up it's become much more accessible yeah and I guess that's true of the um, of the sort of software and and coding that you can use to develop yep. and, and and produce games um, is that is that something that you you, you know you accessed or um, and and do you think that 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 sort of that's opened up the the industry to allow people to find those alternative routes in? So, yeah. like you said, you didn't go to university, but you could get stuck into it at home. You yeah. could use your own laptop, you know, um, and and self self teach yeah. um, what you needed to know. I think. Uh, especially like the software we use it's um primarily be because it's so easy to teach people game making from that software so that's why we use it um you know you can sit down because telling someone to learn a coding language can be quite intimidating especially when we're teaching um you know we we start teaching students as young as eight because that's the the school curriculum has changed and that's kind of where we came from we filled that void where primary school had to teach coding but they didn't have the staff to do it um, and when we were already doing it in our own center so we was like oh we do that um, we just filled that that gap but the software we use is um, it uses like a, a visual coding language so as long as you can teach them the logic of you know telling a computer how to do things it uses um, like conditions and events now software um, and other game engines have changed so Unreal, which is like an industry standard engine, um, they use blueprints, and that's a similar thing. It's using logic rather than like um, raw code, like C plus plus. So people are able to start making games without learning through programming first. Programmers are always essential in the industry. 
to make these things in the first place but you can start making a game now with no coding experience if you wanted so it's definitely more accessible there are a lot more engines which um, have a free version so people can start click team have one so our students can all download it for free and try it out yeah um so yeah no definitely so you, you mentioned click team i'm familiar with a um piece of software called bubble which i believe is a, is is an it's sort of branded as a no code i think that's similar to scratch i think right. we, a lot of schools use um scratch as their okay go to um software so you'll hear that one a lot from anyone in schools but uh, yeah click team we just think there's a bit more freedom to it yeah. um, and it's as complex as you want to make well, I it I guess what they've all got in common is that they sort yeah. of good entry yes tools in to to having a go and, yeah. and, and and seeing if you like it okay so you've you've talked a little bit there about filling that gap in schools um, you know primary schools have got to start delivering yeah. some code into tell us a little bit more about the company so it's a it's a gaming company, but what do you do? So we encourage young people to make positive video games. So instead of them just sat in the room, um, sat in the room like playing games all day, we want them to come out to our centre, uh, meet other like-minded students, and make games um, together. So the whole plan is that any young person that wants to make games that has like that ambition, we give them an opportunity. So. Um, we've always tried to structure it where the young people never pay anything to attend these sessions. Um, it's all community driven. So we, we are a CIC. So we uh, uh, most of the stuff we do, it's all community driven. But over time, we, we have ended up doing commissions for other people. So if someone has an idea for a game or a company wants this app making, we'll make it. And then that money goes back into running these groups so that the... The young people never actually have to pay. The groups are there so that they're learning different stages of development, different ways of making games. But the the whole purpose was um, anyone passionate about it has the opportunity to to learn it. Um, but yeah, it just it escalated. It it snowballed. We, you know, um, like I said, we we started doing some work for the local museum, but. It was when, um, 2018, we won the BAFTA for um, Young Games uh, Mentoring Award. And after that, uh, we just got a lot more interest. People started to kind of call us in for bigger jobs or um, press started picking up. And it really helped. So people knew then that in Bradford there was this opportunity. Um, but now we've we've spread a bit. Now we're, we're doing some work with Calderdale and mm -hmm. we've done work with Leeds, Manchester, Wakefield. So, yeah. And I think... You know, you've you, you've chosen to to go down that route where you're passing on your knowledge and skills to yeah. to young people. You could have created a company that just produced games. Yeah. So, what is it about that 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 inspires you? What why have you chosen to to share that knowledge and those skills rather than just sort of making a career out of doing it yourself? I think. It's a good question. It's so sometimes um, the thought does cross my mind often. Like, do I want to put more time into development? But I think the reason I stay is um, I've become really comfortable. So from when I started just volunteering my time at youth centres just for something positive to do, I just think just investing in young people. Um, you know, because they're going to become the future generation. You want you want to pass it on to keep it it going. But I think for me, um, I was not in a position like at school. I couldn't go out and learn the stuff I wanted. So I think now it's going. Look, I didn't have a great time at school. I never got to learn how to make games unless I was doing something outside of school. So now we want it. So oh, um, you know, the young people of today will have that opportunity. They can choose to do it. So I think it's just giving them something we we didn't, and trying to keep the the games industry having like um, you know fr fresh new inspiration and like more people joining it. So I think I think as well helped me through a pretty rough time in my life helping young people. So for me, it's just keeping it going. It's always been a a good source of like positive energy. We'll keep doing it because I yeah. know what you're doing is 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 really 
appreciated by not just the young people that take part, but certainly the work you're doing with us by um, by our college staff. So our staff and students are working with you on the Impact Game as Academy. That's been funded by Northern Rail. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about that project? Yeah, I, I'm actually really excited for this project because we've refined down. So first few weeks where people giving it a go, see if, see if they like it. And then we've refined them groups down to the ones that think, oh, I, I really want to be part of a project making a final product. Um, so we've got these groups um, and it's going to be really fun having like a long term project. So we get to spend time with these students making a final product for a for a proper client and it'll give them that experience of being in a development team so it'll be like being in like a little indie studio so we'll be making um three different games um and they they all have to be themed a certain way for for northern rail but it'll be really fun just to see what they come up with um i think what's going to happen is a high school will come in they'll develop the concept of the game and then us and the college students will be like the dev team behind making it. So I have no idea whatsoever what we're going to end up creating. Um, but now I'm really excited. It's going to be good working with um, like a team for longer. Yeah, and and I think what you've talked about there with them becoming a development team. Obviously, there's the the technical skills that the students are going to have to demonstrate. But yeah. what else are they going to have to? What are the skills are they going to have to employ? to make that project work and what are you going to be trying to develop in the students for me the thing that stands out especially early stages is the passion um, if they stand out and it's like I can see that um, they've gone home they've learned a bit extra from what I've shown them in that day and they come back it just shows how passionate they are about it um, so I'm always looking out for the ones who kind of go the extra mile so it'll give them the experience working in a team but um, I think that's the thing I look out for first their skills can improve over time but if the door want to develop them that's the tricky bit but all the ones it's really nice having this group that sure they want to put the time in they want to learn um and also some of them have been learning off their own backs and that's that's the thing i it, you you can't teach anyone that if they do it themselves that's the thing you look out for so it's, it's yeah exciting seeing uh, this group. And, the, and they're going to develop a whole load yeah. of other skills aren't they alongside that so teamwork absolutely yep. working as a team i mean you know i've got experience of managing um creative yeah. areas in in colleges quite often you walk into an it or a games design classroom and it's lots of people working individually at a pc yep now that actually is, yes that's an aspect of the role but there's a huge amount of teamwork that goes yeah. into producing a game, isn't there? Yeah, if if you are capable of doing your role, so I, uh, we're going to break them down. So if someone's really good and really passionate about the art side, they'll get more roles and opportunities to do that in the project. But they they will understand that if they don't do their area, that's going to have an effect on the rest of the team. So they're going to have to come down to like sit together, talk about what the plan is, um, have like milestones set so it's, it's, it's going to be a good way of replicating the experience but definitely this opportunity is really good for letting them demonstrate teamwork and so what about our, our students that are on a, a, a level three program you know we've talked about the fact that people can develop the skills um on on their own in their own time what what are the routes for them you personally didn't go to university but what what are the options for them post 16 post 18 so if if their ambition is that they want to work in a triple a studio and working on massive projects with hundreds of people then definitely you know pick the route that they want to go down so once they've highlighted the area they're interested in go down that route so if someone's real passionate about the um program side or the art side they would go into coding and or like concept art or um you know 3D art, they'll, they'll, they'll pick something to go down. Go to uni for that, get some experience so that when they go to apply, you know, they've, sh they've shown the time commitment to the, the studio. But for people that 
maybe they don't want to go to uni or they don't feel at that moment in time they can um, don't stop I think what they should be doing is going to events and networking because there's a massive perk of who you know in the industry and especially if it's um, an indie studio environment they're wanting to go for what they need to do is make um, a game reel so all their work all their best work we need to put together in like a digital portfolio go to events show people you never know might come across someone who goes oh we're currently hiring for a um you know an artist and then you show them it and they might just say this is really good come for an interview um it, it's definitely who you know so and just be a nice person if, if you're networking you're a nice genuine person developers pick up on it mm -hmm. and they they talk and it's they're more likely to get an interview if you're being nice rather than look at my work look how good it is just just chat with them and the thing i've been really interested in um with some of the students that i've worked with in the past um they've gone on to to careers that are outside of the games industry but utilizing the skills that they've learned yeah. on those courses so for instance you know 3d modeling yeah. software and skills are used across automotive yeah. manufacturing architecture so you know there are other pathways to take with those skills aren't there yeah we i mean um our, our team we have a very small team but not all of us um have come from a background of games some people have only been in the background of education and they still work with us still working within the games industry but their passion is in a different area but it works either way too yeah it, um 3d models going to making films and and all sorts and like you said architecture so yeah definitely um certain skills are transferable mm -hmm. so it's just remembering to look for where it could be transferred to i know that esports yeah. and the whole esports market yeah is absolutely huge mm -hmm. um and as an industry the the sort of um you know the revenues that it's generating yeah. um are, are, are massive what what i'm interested in is how you think young people um can prepare for a career in esports um we're looking to we're looking to begin an esports program yeah. here at Calderdale College. So, why do you think young people should be looking to to get involved in a program like that? I think the two main reasons I'd break it down to is reason one being if the young person wants to become an esports player um, in terms of the one who would be on the team winning the cash prizes having an opportunity to be coached and taught and understand how they're meant to play the game um is, is vital because you can't make someone the world's best player like you could never teach that to someone but if they've never had the opportunity to understand how they're meant to play the game they'd never be able to grow and see how far they could go so it'd be really good for um for people to be in an environment that's showing them you're meant to play the game like this this is the, the best way to play it you can't make someone the most accurate sniper in a game by coaching them because that's on their skill level but over time they can improve and if they're in that environment of being shown what to do especially in team-based games which is massive in esports so like overwatch um, you need to be a team player otherwise you're gonna lose so having that team who can provide the support and you know have the environment where everyone knows kind of their role and what they're meant to do it's going to give you that, a better opportunity to get to a point where you might end up entering a tournament and then seeing how far you can go um so it, it's tricky it's it's setting their ambitions though saying that the course isn't going to make the world's best player but it gives you the chance to improve your skills and, and see how far you can get the other side of the coin if the person isn't going to be the number one player or top 500, um, you know, because being realistic, it, it is the top 500 that get picked for these things. It's great to show them that there's so many different areas in that industry as well. So mm. like the games industry brackets <clears throat> off into loads. So does esports. So showing them that 
oh, you don't have to be the number one player to be in esports. You could be the, if you're really good at commentating on that action, that's a whole role in itself. They might really enjoy that. And it's showing them that they can mm -hmm. do that separately. It's but, like you've read my question, TJ. <laughs> what, that, that was my next question. What, what, because I know that, you know, esports isn't just about yeah, yeah. playing the game. So what else um, can can people do if they're looking to get into that industry? What are the other roles and what are the skills that they need to develop to to be successful? I think if te teamwork is, is key. If you can't work in a team, you're only ever going to be someone who's recruited by being on a leaderboard at being like one of the top ranks. But in terms of teamwork, it is pretty essential because if you're not going to go into a role of being the person that like compare um you're gonna want to coordinate with people so there's there's many opportunities to go into um there's the streaming side which breaks off into you might be the streamer you might be the person who's commentating on on the on the action um there's even um, fitness and nutrition in the sports like realm as well so that's actually um, very important so you get people coming in who who probably aren't gamers who are just very up on their fitness and nutrition and they get employed to coach the team so that their their body is looked after yeah and there's sort of sports psychology involved yeah. as well isn't there? yeah um you know making sure that they are taking regular breaks they're hydrated so like an actual athletic team they they it's quite structured and that's all around optimizing performance presumably yeah so I think a lot of deprived. people will will. I think yeah. there's still a lot of misconception about esports and the thought that gaming is, yeah, you know, something that you do as a pastime. Yeah, you know, and it's. I guess it's a little bit. In some ways, it's like any kind of competition or competitive sport. Um, so when you're talking about, you know, you you're only really going to make financial gain from playing. If you're in the top 500, I guess you know that's similar to football or or, or any big sport. But like those, um, like those sports, there are lots of other roles and support um, mechanisms around the yeah. players. Yeah, it, it's it's strange because you, if when I first ever mentioned to any of like my friends that like what esports were, they they thought it was just football games basketball games like sport games and i was like no no it's like a wider race it's a competitive angle of it and it confuses a lot of people um and a lot of people are still getting used to it but yeah i think people do end up not looking after themselves when they're playing games um but i think because esports is in the spotlight as well it's yeah they're, they're, they're trying to do it in a very professional way so and i think it's about breaking down barriers yeah you know, misconceptions, myth busting. You know, I can imagine if I'd gone to my parents and said, I'm going to do yep. a two year college course. Um, it's called esports. I'm, I'm going to be, you know, it's about gaming. Yeah. They may not have looked on that very favorably. It's very common that, yeah. So some people um, have had quite a, a bad reaction when they've, they've yeah, tried yeah. saying, oh, when people turn around and say, I want to be a streamer, they, Sometimes the family reacts in a, a certain way, but some people are very successful. It's just being being realistic and knowing, kind of, um, because it is an industry that you know requires you to be at like the top of your game in one section, and then the other section is you still got to have a good, strong like understanding of it. So it's it's just yeah, if they've got a course that's going to give them that information, um, it's definitely a, a better route into it than just trying to do it off their own back, not knowing where to start. I mean, for us as a college as well, you know, launching a new course, we, we've got to sort of raise awareness, yep. um, not not just of young people, but of their parents as well, and yeah. and and you know, try to give them an understanding yeah. of the opportunities and the sort of personal and skill development yeah. that 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 that's going to offer. I mean, I know that the the actual championships that that run in esports are huge yeah. um, and that the UK is hosting a, a global um, championship in 2024. Yeah. Um, 
which I believe is the highlight of the um, of the esports uh, calendar. So, are those tournaments popular, and are, you know, are they well attended? What 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 can people expect at a tournament like that? When it comes to you know, you've got like League of Legends, you had Overwatch League. Overwatch League's I, I think it's died down a bit. It, it, when it was at its peak, um, you, you're talking people are attending and comparing to other sports i'd definitely say there's a a bigger audience with like league of legends when it's like they're like you know finals then you, you you're talking there's more money in it than a lot of people even know you know like six figures and stuff for the winners and um the, the amount of people that attend blows out some of the other stadiums and other sporting events and it's just not even known to some people but just to be clear these aren't online events these are in person in person in a, in a proper stadium yeah um fully attended um you, you know you, you you get probably there's probably hundreds of people never even get to go to it because they'll be sold out so the the, the massive in, fan base as a spectator is it exciting to watch what yeah so my the i used to um london spitfires is the team that i'd support and it's it's really good you've got that like the the atmosphere and all when when your team is winning but when they're not winning you still got it's, it's still a good atmosphere it's just yeah um it, it's it, it's it's if you talk to someone who only watches football and then you say, yeah, but this is my team, this is who I support, they think it's like a completely different thing, but it's mm -hmm. not. It's like, no, this is the team I support. And like I know the individual people and what they're good at. And it's it's fun to, to, to follow. And there's merchandise and everything. I was just going to say that because I guess with any sort of yeah. product or, or brand or something that's sort of um, got real appeal, yeah. you've got all the marketing, um, all the branding, all the merchandise. Yeah. Um, so you know the sort of value of that is huge, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, I mean it's it's becoming easier and easier for individuals to have their own merch as well. Like streamers can have their own merch store. You don't even have to be part of a team. So the access is is, is so accessible now. Um, but I think having the, it as team merch and stuff, if you're going to have a team, it is a good. It is and a I good guess thing. therefore esports is contributing to the the wider economy you yeah. know have got those supply chain um that you know all of those sort of products and, yeah. and and um merchandise the equipment that's used all of that's going to be um adding value yeah i know that you've recently um moved moving back onto <laughs> onto you and, and and your company and your role i know that you've you talked about creating apps i know you've recently launched your own app um, yes. So, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? And what is the app? What's the, what's the purpose of it? What does it do? So, I uh, it took a lot longer to develop than I intended. It was meant to be just a, a quick concept, but um, I, I I did it entirely independently. So, like outside of my um, you know, work time, so I didn't really get a lot of time on it. But the the idea came from. Um, so before I, I was going to have some surgery, I was really, really nervous. And I always, if, if I was sat in the waiting room, I was sat and I was just like, I need something to occupy me that's quick, but I can just get into really quick. And I and I thought, um, you know, when you used to go to like the bowling alleys and you'd have them arcade machines and you have to push the button when the bar gets to the center and you're trying to like stack it up. Yeah, yeah. And you're like, the, you can only get the prize when you get to the top. And I don't know why I just thought of that. And I thought, how can I turn this door into like a, a, an app? So the whole the whole premise of it was I wanted a, an app that anyone could play. So it's going to be just a single touch app. And it's just there as a distraction. So it's just a free distraction to help people who are in like a stress. Or even on the way to work, so like if you're bored. It's nice that it's free. I've lost a lot of money on that particular game that you're talking about. At the, yeah. At the arcade. Yeah. yeah. I, I thought I just want something that anyone can use. Um and yeah, the concept was just from when I was in waiting rooms, waiting for appointments, which I didn't want to be, be in. And so um, what's it called? What is it? So I, it's called Stackham, yeah. um, E M uh, um, at the end, and it's just um, a little bird with a with with a box, and it's it's on Google Play Store, and it's just a, yeah, free app to download, 
try people to get people like less stressed, um, help with anxiety and stuff like that. And how's that going? Have you had some? It's just come out of beta, so it's just launched now. So, okay. um, l- you know, luckily I had lots of people willing to um, like do some testing on it for free, give me f- feedback. So, um, it was originally going to have like the competitive angle, but then I thought that might not help with someone in a stressful situation. So. Uh, in the future, it might gain like a, a global leaderboard or something. But at the moment, it's just there for um, your like your own personal like beating your own high scores. But every over Christmas, though, what we do is people who want to take part, they can submit their high score on social media, and the highest scoring person can pick a charity, and then I just donate to that charity. So it's just like a, a we did it during beta, and now we're doing it this Christmas. So. It's, that's it that's kind of the concept but it's okay. just launched so you're creating games but I guess you know you can use programming and gamification to enhance other platforms yeah user experience could be websites you know have you had any involvement in sort of um, spin-off um, activities where you using the the same sort of um skills but applying it in a different scenario uh, i think the com- most common one is uh, qa like because when it comes to testing we, we we break games all the time and any project we we we're on something breaks someone has to test it and like purposely try and break it so that is across the board like no matter what the project is especially helpful when we've worked on bigger projects um we need more people testing so yeah i think that's probably the skill which is really transferable because you're just trying to find a way to break whatever the project is you're working on and then use logic and think oh how could this be fixed um so that's and it's also one of the best ways in into the industry um a lot of places will take people doing qa even without like degrees and stuff, as long as they're, they're passionate, they've got an interest. Uh, it's a really good way into the industry and one surrounding it. So along our, uh, alongside our eSports offer that will be starting in September 24, we'll also be introducing games design. Yeah. Uh, and I'm quite excited to get some um, events and um, workshops running with um, schools, yeah. And, and and local young people and perhaps getting them to build and design an app would be quite would be quite a good yeah. um you know i'm sort of thinking a two or three day um activity where we bring young people employers and there's an element of competition about it but we bring people together a, a game jam sounds really good like yeah. uh, i mean Community wise, but also like um, some of the end products are surprisingly good. So they've ended up becoming real games of um, from like game jams. Sometimes they've gone, oh, this is actually really fun, yeah. and they've gone home and worked on it. Then so yeah, I think it, game jams are really good. Yeah. So watch out because we're probably yeah. going to get you get I'm you involved with to that. It. I'd love to. <laughs> yeah, coming spring twenty four. Um, okay, so. Thinking about, which I, I said I was going to talk to you about the highs and the lows. So let's just pick out perhaps your, your biggest high. I'm thinking it might relate to the BAFTA. I, I think, yeah. <laughs> the, yeah, I think the BAFTA is the the, the, the highlight of the of uh, as Korea and what we've done so far. It, it, it's, it didn't op- only open more doors. Um, it was just, we weren't expecting it. We were just... You know, we were just happy to be there, but then winning was just um, beyond a nice surprise. It was not expected, but it was. We we're very grateful for it, and then it's been really good in terms of growing us and and also awareness of what we we do. So it, it's really helped with growing. Um, and, and conversely, then, what's been your single biggest setback? It kind of ticks both. It's personal and uh, work. We 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 got we got hacked by there was um, something like it called a crab file, and we had years ago uh, before we moved center, 
we actually got this. It's like a virus and it corrupts all your files and then they hold it at ransom. So I had a folder that I'd been adding to for two years and it targets the biggest file in the system. So my folder got corrupted and I lost two years of work and that really set me back. I was like really down about it and I'd lost projects I'd been working on. Um, I'd been making a, a turn-based combat engine for some of the students because they wanted to make that kind of game and it's not built into the program. So I refined this little engine down from and then I just lost it. So that that was that was like a, a proper kick. Um, so, I mean, the next part of that question was mm. going to be, you know, we all encounter setbacks yeah. at some point in our careers. That sounds pretty devastating. Yeah. How do you pick yourself up and move on? It was just just being willing to put the time back into work on something else, just start from scratch again. And like, cause it's not like cause the knowledge had been deleted. It was just the actual saved files of stuff we'd created. Luckily a lot of students work was saved cause um, their file size was smaller. So it, it was mainly like me, Adam and like the, the work we'd been working on. So it was just, um, we, we upgraded security for, for one. And then I was yeah. going to ask lessons learned. So yeah. upgrading security, I'm guessing that you start to spread your your, your files that you're saving now across more folders. Yeah, I, anything I work on, which is like my own projects, I work from home and then have my own security and then work projects again. It's just a different system, a, an additional backup. It's just um, finding you know getting people in with more experience in networking. So it's is that a big problem in the industry sort of theft of intellectual yeah property every now and again um you'll you will hear in the news about how sony's down for a day or xbox is down and that's the same thing it's people hacking into the systems so some people do it to try and get a job and some people do it for like different motives but yeah it, it happens fairly often um it's it hits the news now and again if it's gone through if it's worked but normally it happens that often they don't even talk about it. So we've talked about your journey from, well, it was quite varied at the start, wasn't yep, it? So yep. you sort of thought you wanted to work in gaming, then looked at, mili uh, at a yeah. military career, then went back to, to gaming. If you could change anything about that journey from where you were then to where you are now, what, what would it be? I'd, I'd have just stuck at what I did. So when I... When I started, um, when when I started college, I also started uh, making content on YouTube, which was all game related. So if I could um, like change things, I'd have just stuck at what I was doing, what I was enjoying, and I'd have put all my resources into upgrading my kit. So I'd have kind of just uh, instead of taking that time out and losing a lot of progress, I'd have been higher in that area. Because um, that, that's another area I really enjoyed doing. I went into like content creation, streaming at one point. Um, so I think if I'd have stuck at it, I'd have just been more more knowledgeable or I'd have had better kit and um, just advanced more. And how do, how do young people um, build that confidence to sell themselves and their skills? I'm thinking that this industry you know yes you've got your big um you know production companies yep. but there must be lots of independents yeah. and and micro um businesses for for an individual how how important is is marketing yourself and and what advice would you give to people about um developing that that skill I think even if if you're not going to like sell yourself in terms of um, like being a content creator or a streamer in that way, I think it's really essential to be, still be yourself. Be honest, but I think if you are a, just a nice person, uh, like you, you're quite genuine, you're nice to be around. That really helps people engage with you better, and um, you know you're more likely to get someone who will introduce you to someone they know if, if you're just a nice, honest person. So I think that's really important. In terms of 
selling yourself in, with um, with other areas like content creation or even other specific jobs. Find what's unique about you. So find something which is different because there's there's hundreds of thousands of people going for a similar thing. So you've got to find something unique. Um, so like for me, um, I I used to make content for Epic Games. So I used to be on their content creation program. And my angle was because everybody in Fortnite was really good at building. I used to have to try and get as many wins as I could without building at all. Obviously, they brought in zero builds now. So everybody is is in the same boat but at the time that was my angle i just would join a match and never build um so that's how i got like a bit of my, my reputation um so that helped with that area whilst i whilst i was still at the contract with them but it's just for that. it's just finding something unique something different um but again most people if you if you're a nice genuine person people will stick around um they'll introduce you to people if you could give one single piece of advice to someone looking to begin a career in this sector, what would it be? Define what sector you want to go into first. Like, pick the thing you enjoy and then decide what your end goal is. If it is AAA, you are going to have to go down the, you know, go, go to university. Um so I think, yeah, de defining what area you want to go into um, as early as you can, really. But that would mean probably getting some experience in a few areas. So get out there, go to events, meet people um, once you've decided. Yeah. So I know that the, the world is transforming digitally at yeah. a rapid rate. What about the future of gaming? What does that look like? Very advanced, very very realistic. Um, you know, v virtual realities. Um, people trying to plug into games, so it's as immersive as possible. So you physically, you feel things in the games. That's where it's heading, and mm -hmm. that's quite realistic at this point. So it's very exciting. Yeah, absolutely. I ask the same question of every guest on this podcast. Um, as as we come to the end of our chat. I want you to imagine um, that you can send a text to your younger self. What would it say? Stick stick at what I was doing back then, like at the point where I started studying games and like making content. Stick with it. That's what I'd have told myself. That's it's, it's the thing that I've stayed passionate about. It's been like the one consistency. So I just stick at it. Don't take any timeouts. Mm -hmm. Try not to get injured. Um, just stick with doing that. It's a simple message. Yeah. Stick at it. Um, and I really hope you do because I know the work that we're doing with you um, is fantastic and we can't wait to do more of it. It's very exciting times. I can't wait to see what the next few years bring the company. And me personally, I think development's definitely taken um, a higher priority in working on even solo projects now. Mm -hmm. So it's... Yeah, it's all, it's all very new and exciting. It's been great to chat to you. Thank you for giving up your time today. Thanks for having me. TJ. Um, and I'm sure that we'll be um, chatting again yeah. um, about all things esports very, very soon. Look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you.